Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for these very kind words. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. It's a tremendous honor to be here. Uh, I think the theme of this society is uh, exactly uh, where, what it should be, and it's a very important theme, and I've, uh, I love this place, so I'm uh, very honored to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a paper uh, that I've written with uh, Martin Schneider, who's also at Stanford, and Kieran Rogers, who is a PhD student at Stanford. He's a wonderful PhD student, and we're trying to keep him as long as possible. Um, so what we're doing in this paper is trying to think about money and banks in a new Keynesian model. Let me show you this picture that is going to motivate some of what we're doing. So this is a picture of interest rates uh, over time. I'm showing you some, some interest rates. Uh, and so what you see is after, uh, in, in recent years, after the financial crisis, now interest rates are going to go back up. Uh, there's some lift up here. Um, and what's interesting is that the interest on reserves has, has been increasing during this time, as well as uh, the green line, which is the rate of short non-financial um, commercial paper. So that rate is also going up. So these two rates are going up. while if you're looking at uh, sort of a broad measure of interest on deposits or a broad measure of interest on money holdings uh, by households, you see that that rate is also increasing, but by much less. So as you think about the liquidity costs that banks have, they're basically almost zero right now because they receive interest on reserves that is as high as short rates. While if you think about the opportunity cost of holding money for households, that is pretty high. Um, and that is not unusual because it was also high before the financial crisis. Uh, so the gray line, again, is the, uh, is the interest on, is a broad measure of interest on deposits. And you see that uh, there was already an opportunity cost of holding money for households before the crisis. What, what is different before the crisis was that banks had a very large opportunity cost of holding reserves. And that is now gone because the spread between short rates and the reserve rate has collapsed to essentially zero. Um, and so we want to think about these various interest rates in a macro model. Uh, so that's our natural step was to go to the standard New Keynesian model. Uh, in that model, the central bank directly controls the interest rates in the household oil equation. So it's fairly powerful in setting, uh, in controlling the interest rate. And there's a focus on Taylor rules for that interest rate in that Euler equation. Um, and in particular, you need the Taylor principle uh, to get determinacy of these models. That means the central bank has to react more than one for one uh, to inflation. Otherwise, that model is not determinate. Um, and the central bank in, in this model also provides directly the money to the households. Uh, so there are no banks. Um, and, but this money provision is not really important. Uh, it doesn't play any, any role in the new Keynesian model. Uh, the money is, is just provided so that um, the central bank can uh, hit its target for the interest rate that enters the Euler equation of households. What we want to think about in this paper is um, a layered payment system where at different layers of the economy payments get made uh, and now we have various interest rates uh, that we saw in the picture. So we have households paying with inside money uh, and they don't hold short bonds directly. Um, instead, banks provide the inside money so it's no longer the government providing the money directly to households, it's banks who provide the inside money uh, and they hold short bonds to back uh, these deposits. Banks pay each other with reserves. That's another kind of money. Uh, and that money is provided by the central bank. So there's going to be different convenience yields, different spreads between interest rates. In particular, there's going to be a convenience yield on inside money and a convenience yield on short bonds that the banks hold mostly. Uh, and within that setup, we can now ask the question, uh, what happens if the policy instrument uh, that the central bank uh, is targeting, is using, earns a convenience yield? Uh, we thought this changing the model this way would not have big effects. But actually, um, what you find is that the Taylor rule is uh, less powerful. You don't need the Taylor principle to have determinacy within this model. 
so you get determinacy for free. Uh, and you can study a much broader range of policy rules within that model. Uh, and the money supply becomes a, an important se separate tool for monetary policy. Uh, and so I'm going to show you these results uh, in different setups. Uh, I'm going to use three different setups uh, to show you these results. The very first <coughs> is a hypothetical economy in which uh, there's central bank digital currency. Uh, so basically, the central bank gives all of us uh, res accounts, reserve accounts, so we can all have accounts with the central bank. Uh, that's, of course, a hypothetical economy. Uh, this is the economy that uh, many central banks are thinking of switching to, of offering uh, reserve accounts to the broad public, that non-banks. Uh, and the, um, within that model, the central bank is going to control the rate on deposits and the supply of deposits. Uh, so the central bank has that directly under its control. In that setup, the effectiveness of policy is going to depend on the elasticity of money demand. Uh, in particular, we're going to get imperfect pass-through from the rate on money to the rate on bonds. Uh, we won't need the Taylor principle in that setup. Uh, and the money supply is going to be a separate tool which determines long-run long inflation in that model. And so you wonder, why should I be worried about a setup which sounds completely artificial because this is not the US economy. We don't have uh, these reserve accounts. For me, this is the simplest way uh, to illustrate what happens in a world where the policy rule has a convenience yield. Uh, so we're going to derive a convenience yield from holding money. Households are going to derive a convenience yield. And so in that first setup, uh, the central bank uh, has a policy instrument that has a convenience yield. And that, that is why I'm getting these results, that I don't need the Taylor principle. Policy is going to be less uh, effective, uh, and the money supply is a separate tool. I'm going to show you that this, these results carry over uh, to more complicated settings in which you have banks that are doing the job of uh, supplying the money. So first, I'm going to start with the current regime that we're in, where banks have abundant reserves. The central bank here controls the reserve rate, which is also equal to the bond rate, uh, which you saw in the picture that I showed you. Right now, the reserve rate is basically equal to the bond rate. And banks are indifferent between holding uh, reserves or bonds, because they are flush in reserves. And the central bank also controls the reserve supply. In this setup, in addition of policy being key, keyly determined by the elasticity of money demand, what also matters is financial structure. So for example, um, you get imp imperfect pass-through uh, that also depends on market power of banks and uh, how much of bank assets is nominally fixed or nominally rigid as opposed to real assets. And another feature of that setup is that money supply shocks include now shocks to uh, loans, uh, the amount of loans that banks have. For example, changes in the bank loan supply, that's going to affect, that's going to look like a money uh, shock in that model. And then, and then you wonder, well, does this only work for banking with abundant reserves? So at the very end, I'm going to come back to the regime that we were in before the financial crisis, where banks had a limited amount of reserves. Um, those reserves were more liquid than bonds. So the reserve rate was below the rate on bonds, which is, again, from the picture that I showed you, that's the feature of the world before the financial crisis. Uh, in that setup, uh, the central bank controls the reserve rate uh, and the supply, and, but is targeting the interbank lending rate. In that setup, I'm going to show you all these results apply. In addition, the effectiveness of policy is going to depend on how banks exactly manage their liquidity. Um, but there's, you see there's a gradual buildup, and I'm going to start with the simplest possible model first, in which there aren't even banks. Uh, but you get the same results there. Uh, there have been New Keynesian models with financial frictions and banks uh, in the literature. Um, the role of banks in these models is uh, that, that they're supplying loans, uh, and they're special at loan making. We're going to say banks are special because they're providing inside money. And so we're having a liability-centric view of banking, if you want. It's not because we think this is the only role that banks play in the economy. It's because that allows us to zero in on the contribution of this paper. <coughs> 
you'll see features of asset pricing uh, with constrained investors in this model. Uh, and um, bank competition is going to play an important role in the transmission mechanism, how uh, much market power banks have. Um, there are other papers with multiple media of exchange here. There's inside money, there's outside money. So these are, in principle, multiple media of exchange. But they're, in our model, they're not competing with each other. So households use inside money, and banks use reserves. And then there's zero, a recent work on the dynamics of the new Keynesian model at the zero lower bound. So let me start with the household model uh, problem that is going to be the same in all these setups that I'm going to show you. So there's a household. Uh, who has separable preferences over consumption goods C, um, real balances, and labor. And I'm going to use some price notations. I need P, the nominal price level. Uh, ID is the interest rate on money holdings. And IS is the nominal short rate. So this is the short rate on a bond that pays $1 uh, next period. And there's a wage, but I won't need notation for the wage. If I compute first order conditions of this problem uh, with respect to consumption and money holdings, I can manipulate them and write them as a money demand equation. And this is how the money demand equation looks like. So this is deposits, or money, uh, and this is how money demand looks like. And if you look at this equation, this is the, the opportunity cost of holding money. And so sigma is the elasticity with respect to the cost of liquidity, of holding money. So that's a key elasticity here. There's a unitary elasticity with respect to spending. But sigma is the key one when you're thinking about how much money holdings depend on the interest rate, on the spread between uh, the short rate and the rate on money. I can also compute uh, first order condition with respect to bond holdings to get a standard looking Euler equation. Uh, and if you do the same for money holdings, uh, you see that you, you get an Euler equation for uh, the interest rate on money. And then there's a convenience yield associated with holding money. And that's this red term. And you see that that rises with spending, uh, and it falls with money. Uh, so there's a convenience yield on holding uh, money that comes because money enters the utility function. What other features do I need in, in this model? I'm going to add a standard set of firms, new Keynesian firms. Uh, they produce consumption goods uh, with a CS aggregate of intermediates with some elasticity epsilon. There are intermediate good firms that uh, have a linear production function. And there is Carvel price setting with some probability of reset data. Okay, So these firms are standard from the new Keynesian model. And so what's different here is what the government does in this model. Uh, so they offer reserve accounts to everyone. Uh, so there is a central bank digital currency here. Uh, they, the government sets a path for their money supply, pays an interest on this money, uh, and then does lump sum taxation uh, to satisfy its budget constraint. Okay, so that's what the government here does. And then markets clear. That's the equilibrium of this model. What happens in the long run in this model? So in the long run, uh, money growth is going to be constant. And that's equal to inflation. And there will be a nominal interest rate on money, which is also constant in the long run. There are uh, Fisher equations uh, for nominal interest rates on bonds, which is just the household discount rate plus inflation. And the real rate on money is just the nominal rate uh, that the government picks minus the inflation rate. Uh, in the long run, there's going to be constant consumption and output. Uh, and that has, I can solve for that analytically. Uh, and if the government chooses to have a higher nominal interest rate, uh, it doesn't increase long run inflation. So there's no weird uh, Fisherian effect here. Uh, so it does, it's not the case that increases in nominal rate somehow uh, increase inflation. Instead, what that does, it lowers the convenience yield. And so that looks like a permanent liquidity effect uh, of higher interest rates. Okay, so this is my uh, long run steady state. And so now I'm going to log linearize. Yes, oh, I have it. OK, so what do I get when I log linearize the, 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 the typical uh, zero inflation steady state, which is what typically new Keynesian models do? You log linearize the model around the zero inflation steady state, and you get 
equations that look familiar if you have worked on with these new Keynesian models before. You get a standard looking Phillips curve. That's the first equation that relates inflation to expected inflation and output. Um, you get a standard looking Euler equation for the interest rate on bonds. Um, there's a money demand equation in this model. And then real balances evolve over time. And mechanically, I can track how they evolve over time in, in levels. How does the standard New Keynesian model think about monetary policy? The standard way of thinking about it is to say, oh, the central bank uh, uses a Taylor rule for the interest rate that enters this Euler equation. Uh, there's an exogenous interest rate on money holdings. And that's typically zero. So the central bank implicitly sets a zero interest rate on money holdings. And once you uh, make these assumptions on how monetary policy works, you get a system that is block recursive. So you can solve for inflation, the interest rate on bonds and output, independently of the real quantity of money. So the real quantity of money is not a state variable in the system. And that makes it easier to solve the system. So you typically just look at these two equations, the Phillips curve and the Euler equation. Uh, the money supply is assumed to just simply adjust so that the central bank can hit its targets for the short-term interest rate for bonds. Uh, and you need the um, Taylor principle, which means that this coefficient, uh, the way the central bank reacts to inflation, has to be larger than 1. That's the Taylor principle. Otherwise, you don't have determinacy. So this is how the standard model works. Let me show you what's different when now, instead of targeting um, the interest rate on bonds, what the central bank does, it's targeting the interest rate on money with a Taylor rule. So they're using this Taylor rule, uh, and the money is exogenous. So instead of endogenously adjusting money to hit uh, the interest rate on bonds, the government here sets an exogenous money supply. Suddenly, now money matters. Inflation, uh, the interest rate on bonds and output now depend on a state variable, which is the real amount of money outstanding. And so this evolution now becomes important, because that's a state variable of the model. And in this version of the model, uh, the interest rate on money and the quantity of money are separate policy tools. And that's going to be important. So here, the Fed has two policy rules. Um, and you get determinacy for any size of the coefficient phi pi. So you no longer need to impose the Taylor principle. So if I compare these two ways of thinking about the same household problem with the same farms, and the only difference is the way policy works. Uh, both models have the New Keynesian Phillips curve. Uh, in the standard model, I have a, a Taylor rule and the Euler equation for the short rate. What's different now is that I'm specifying a Taylor rule for the rate on money. And I can actually uh, use my money demand equation and substitute out for the short-term interest rate in the Euler equation. And then you see, what, see what's going on. I can write the Euler equation this way with a rate on money inside. And so what's very different in, in this way of thinking about monetary policy is that there's now a new term, which is the convenience yield on money, which also enters the Euler equation. And that's going to change. Uh, this is the reason why we have these different implications for the model. Uh, that's what's generating uh, determinacy in the model, regardless of this coefficient on, the, um, on inflation. Uh, and now I have to track money holdings, basically, real man money balances. That's a state variable in the system. And so it makes the solving the model uh, more, a little bit more complicated. Let me show you how a monetary policy shock then works differently from the new Keynesian model to uh, this new way of thinking about policy. This year. Yep. So, so the question is, what are the costs of uh, the, the big question here, and especially about the, the model that uh, we have in mind, where these, this mechanism also holds but then has banks. Uh, a key question for the trade-off between uh, what optimal policy is, is what the leverage uh, costs of the government are. Because just issuing money from the government's point of view is going to have, uh, if there is leverage costs associated with those, uh, I think that modern governments do have leverage costs, then it's a trade-off uh, 
between the leverage cost that I'm going to introduce for banks and the leverage cost that the government has. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. This, is, this little model is not really there to uh, think about optimal policy, because it's really a very simple model that is only there to illustrate this mechanism of why we get determinacy and why the dynamics change completely when you have uh, a rate on money, uh, an interest rate on money. Uh, okay, so let, let, let's think about what happens when you have a Taylor rule. Uh, first, let me talk about the Taylor rule for bonds. So you have, let's say, the, the central bank raises the interest rate on, on bonds. What happens in the standard model? It, let's say this only happens at day zero. On impact, uh, you have a higher real rate on bonds because you have sticky prices. There's an intertemporal substitution mechanism that says uh, there's a higher real rate that lowers consumption through the order equation of the household. Um, and then, because this is a demand-driven model, the New Keynesian model, you get a series of effects. Uh, you get lower inflation. Uh, because there's lower consumption, firms cut their prices. You get lower inflation, lower output. Uh, there's less spending. And then, endogenously, the central bank lowers the money supply because people now use less money uh, to spend. And then next period, if this is just a one-time shock, uh, we're back to steady state uh, with zero inflation. So this is the typical uh, impulse response of a standard New Keynesian model to a monetary policy, to a one-time uh, monetary policy shock. Let's see what's different uh, in this setup, where the policy instrument has a convenience yield. If the, um, if you have a Taylor rule for money, uh, again, I can increase the rate on money. That's my tightening. On impact, I have a higher real rate because it's uh, because of these nominal frictions in the model. Uh, that induces an intertemporal substitution effect, just like before. The higher real rate lowers consumption. Lower consumption means firms cut their prices. They cut output. Uh, spending goes down. Uh, but what's new now here is that there's now a lower convenience yield. And this lower convenience yield means that there's a total lower total return on money. So this, the fact that the Fed increased uh, the rate of money is partially counteracted by the fact that now the convenience yield goes down. So that means there's imperfect pass-through from the rate on money to the rate on bonds because of this partial internal dampening of this monetary policy shock through the convenience yield impact. What happens over time uh, after the shock hits the economy? Well, it depends on what the central bank does with the money supply. Let's say, for simplicity, they j just keep the money supply constant. It's a separate policy tool in this world. Let's say they're keeping it constant. Then this situation looks like there's too much money, because inflation came down, output came down. Uh, if you don't adjust the money supply, that looks like too much money. There's an excess amount of money. Uh, and that works like an expansionary mon money growth shock. Uh, so before, we were trying to tighten. Uh, but this, the policy basically generates an expansionary effect later by keeping money constant. And that, keeps, uh, that, that pushes up inflation and output. And so the effect gradually declines. Before showing you numbers with this, uh, let me talk briefly about how the non-separable case looks like. Because numbers, um, the, the separable case has the weird uh, feature that the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is equal to the uh, elasticity of money demand. And so those two parameters were the same. Uh, and so in the data, the typical estimates are that they're not the same. And so let me introduce non-separable utility so that I can distinguish the intertemporal elasticity of substitution from the elasticity of money demand. So I basically now use just a CES aggregate of consumption and real balances. I now get a money demand equation that looks like this. So here is real balances. And they depend on the opportunity cost of this liquidity with this parameter eta. So eta is now my money demand elasticity. If eta is low, then money demand responds less to the cost of liquidity. So it's inelastic. Uh, so now I can substitute again. I can substitute this short rate into the Euler equation for bonds, and I get this new Euler equation. The first line looks just like in the traditional uh, New Keynesian model. The second line is what's new here. There's now a convenience yield uh, that changes the dynamics of this model. Uh, 
and the size of this eta coefficient governs how important this uh, convenience yield effect is. Uh, so if eta is low, if money is less elastic, the convenience yield effect is very important. Um, the typical estimate uh, of this elasticity in the literature is that the money demand elasticity is 0.2, so I'm going to stick with 0.2. And so here's how this looks like uh, quantitatively. So we pick standard numbers, uh, a log utility. So the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is 1. Uh, the money demand elasticity is 0.2. All the other parameters are standard New Keynesian parameters. Here's what happens as the Fed increases uh, the interest rate. So first, the, the standard impulse response. The Fed increases the interest rate on bonds. Uh, what happens, the price level falls, uh, it stays low, it's a one-time shock and then it stays low, and then that generates a recession with a deflation and output goes down. That's the blue line, uh, it's the standard model, and then uh, here's the reaction of the interest rate on bonds, it goes up and then it slowly, de slowly declines down. And the, it's, to the extent it was, that is this the, the first, um, the first realization of this interest rate on bonds is lower is because already in the Taylor rule, as inflation comes down here, uh, the, the Fed is counteracting immediately uh, by lowering rates. Now look at the pink line, which is monetary policy when the Fed controls the rate of money. The price level drops, but then because uh, of this counteracting expansionary effect of keeping the money supply constant, the price level actually goes up again, so it's inflationary. And then, uh, yes, you generate a recession by contracting the money supply, but the recession is much less deep. Output falls about a third less uh, in this version of the model. And then the money rate is here, and you see some dampening. Uh, it's imperfect pass-through to the bond rate, which is this dotted line in my version of the model with a money rate. So you get already at um, standard parameters for the money elasticity uh, a sizable quantitative effect from this, uh, from this dampening through the convenience yield. And we have work with Moritz Leno uh, that looks at money demand elasticity estimations. If you actually take out long-term trends in uh, how money how, how the velocity of money uh, evolves over the post-war period, you get uh, even lower ADAS. So the money, there's reason to believe that this is sort of a conservative uh, picture here that I'm showing you, because I think that ADA is much lower than 0.2. Uh, it's about 0.7. So I showed you this, uh, the first version, where the government issues money directly um, to households. Um, so I showed you the first version, and, uh, but that was a hypoth hypothetical world in which we all have these reserve accounts with the central bank. Uh, let me now introduce banks. Uh, so this is a world in which the government controls the rate on reserves and the supply of reserves, uh, and only banks hold reserves. Households uh, use deposits issued by banks, so inside money, to make payments. In this world, the rate on deposits and their supply are endogenous. Before, they were under direct control by the central bank. Now they're endogenous things that banks uh, have a key role in determining. And so let's look at a version of, the, of that model. Um, so banks here, so I'm going to start with the competitive banking sector, and I'm going to introduce uh, market power uh, in a few slides. So let's start competitive. Uh, so banks have some ba have a balance sheet where they have they're holding some reserves and some other assets A, and they issue money D. Uh, so this is some modern version of money where electronic money that we use to make payments with uh, is now issued by banks, and they have equity. And so how do they behave? Um, banks here are just firms, and they maximize shareholder value. There's some cash flow. What is the cash flow that the bank has? It's just basically changes in the value of these positions. Is banks come in uh, with some amount of reserves, they get interest on reserves, then they choose to hold new reserves. They come in, they have issued these deposits, they have to pay interest on deposits, then they receive new deposits. 
and they had some assets before, they get some interest rates on these assets, uh, and they choose new asset holdings. Uh, so that's the cash flow of the bank at time t, and the shareholders basically maximize the present value of these cash flows. Banks um, also face a leverage constraint, because in this model, deposits, households like to hold deposits because they use them to make payments. They enter the utility function, and so banks uh, see that this is really a cheap source of funding. And so unless you put on some constraints, banks would go uh, all the way with deposit funding. Uh, we know that that is not uh, what happens in the data. And so what we assume is that there's uh, some leverage constraint. So banks can't issue more deposits than some fraction L of uh, their assets. And here I'm risk weighing assets. I put some coefficient rho here in front of these assets. Uh, that says maybe these assets are low credit, uh, they have low quality assets, and then this row says these assets are not as good as collateral as reserves themselves. And so this uh, row reflects the, the quality of the assets, essentially, uh, of the collateral that backs this inside money D. So these deposits and inside money, that's uh, what's being backed here, and so it has to be high quality assets. How does bank optimization work in this world? Uh, what banks do is they see that they have to pay a return on, to their shareholders. That's IS. So they, there's a required nominal rate of return on equity. They know, banks know that they have to deliver this. And their optimal portfolio choice now is going to equate the return on equity on the left-hand side with whatever return of assets that they want to hold. Uh, so the first asset is reserves. Reserves pay an interest on reserves. That's the first term. This is the financial reward from holding reserves. It's the interest on reserves. But then there's an additional term here, which has to do with uh, gamma t. Gamma t is the Lagrange multiplier on exactly this leverage constraint. So the higher uh, gamma t, the stronger, uh, the more this leverage constraint binds. And so you can see that holding reserves not only comes with a financial return, uh, which, which is the interest on, on reserve, but plus this uh, benefit from having more collateral. The same is true for other assets. Other assets also have a financial return, but then there is a collateral benefit. It's a lower collateral benefit than for reserves because of this coefficient rho here, because other assets are lower, are, are not as good collateral as reserves. And so you see the difference in these two first other conditions. But the basic principle is you're equating the rate of return on your asset with the rate of return that you're promising shareholders. How does optimal money creation work? Again, the bank is comparing the rate of return on, uh, on equity with um, the interest rate that they have to pay on, on deposits plus leverage costs, basically. That's the gamma is here. Um, capturing leverage costs is how tight these collateral constraints are. And so if I combine uh, these equations, uh, then I can figure out what the cost of liquidity is in the banking system and the cost of liquidity of households. And in particular, there's a coefficient 1 over L here involved. And L is the leverage constraint, so it's smaller than 1. So banks in this model pass on to the consumer their cost of liquidity with a multiple um, that is larger than one. How does the equilibrium with banks look like? Uh, well, there are markets for reserves and other bank assets. Uh, there's an, we assume there's an exogenous supply of bank assets uh, that they can invest in. There's a policy rule that now sets the interest on reserves and the quantity of reserves. There are new endogenous objects. One is the real amount of reserves. Then the, um, this is the typo. This, is the, uh, this should be the interest on bonds, the interest on money, and the interest on assets. These are the endogenous uh, variables. The Phillips curve and the bond order equation from the previous model that I showed you are unchanged. I didn't do anything to them. Uh, what's new in this setup with banks is that you can take the money demand equation, substitute out for deposits in the money demand equation using this binding collateral constraint. And that gives me this equation. And on the right-hand side of this, of, um, 
the Euler equation, I'm substituting out, uh, I'm using the first order conditions of the banks uh, to introduce the interest rate on reserves. And you now look at an equation that looks a lot like the demand of banks for collateral. So they have some demand, the little m's again are uh, all uh, log deviations from steady states. Um, this is the demand for reserves and other assets. And on the right hand side, you see the convenience yield uh, for banks. This is an additional equation in addition to, to the Phillips curve and the bond oil equation. And now we also have to keep track not just of reserves, but also of other asset holdings. And so there, here's the equivalence result that we basically get is that this is the same structure as the model that I showed you before where the government was directly issuing money to the households. Here, the, mon the government is issuing reserves. Banks use these reserves to produce inside money endogenously, and so, but it has the exact same structure. And in particular, uh, what the Fed is doing, it's controlling its policy instrument has a convenience yield here. Uh, and so it's, it's the result. All the results are now going to carry over. Uh, so here's again the smart bank collateral demand with a convenience yield in it. The key coefficient for thinking about the transmission of monetary policy in this version of the model is this. Before it was just the elasticity of money of households, of money demand by households. Now it's, there's a new coefficient, a new term here, which is L, which is the leverage constraint. Uh, and so if the leverage constraint is, or collateral constraint is laxer, so that banks can lever up more, this is going to look like a lower interest rate elasticity. Uh, and so we know that banks are very levered, uh, and so that is going to be an important channel through which uh, the mechanism that I was explaining to you before, that the convenience, the, the effect of monetary policy on the convenience yield basically dampens the transmission of monetary policy. That's going to be stronger here as L is higher. Um, another feature of this equation is that shocks to other bank assets, this A matter, in particular, they work just like uh, shocking this, uh, these assets is going to just work like shocking, uh, like a money supply shock or reserve sh supply shock. Um, the assumption in uh, this version that I've been uh, showing you assumes that all the other assets are fixed in nominal terms. With real assets, if banks hold a lot of real assets, uh, then interest rate policy is more effective. So the, this effect through the co convenience uh, yield is less strong. And then the question is, in the data, what is it? What is the type of asset that uh, banks hold? And so if you think that banks uh, hold a lot of long-term debt, for example, uh, long-term uh, fixed rate mortgages, they, those are fixed in nominal terms, uh, then uh, the, the version that I showed you is the right one, where A is fixed in nominal terms. It's nice to introduce market power uh, in this model because that's what we see in the data, is that banks seem to have market power. What is one uh, simple way of introducing market power is to assume that we have many monopolistically competitive banks. They offer different types of accounts, deposit accounts, and the household values a CS aggregate of all these different accounts. And so the coefficient eta B is the elasticity of substitution between these bank accounts, and that governs how much, how powerful these banks are. So if I then rederive uh, the marginal cost pricing, so this is the opportunity cost of holding money for banks. This is the, the spread uh, with reserve, with the interest rate on reserves. I can see that this equation was just L, uh, 1 over L before, but now I get this new term. That's the mic up uh, in the setup with monopolistically competitive firms. So you have market power here is going to increase this uh, mic up. So then I can rederive uh, the collateral demand that I showed you before, and this is how it looks like now. Uh, there's the same convenience yield on the right right hand side. This is the demand for assets, and the key coefficient now is a conglomerate of various components. Some of our some of them are household components. This is the elasticity of money demand by households, ADA. Uh, there's also leverage, this one we saw before, but with market power, you now get this additional coefficient, which says, well, if uh, market power is really important uh, and you see high mic-ups, then 
that increases this interest rate elasticity. So that would weaken the effect uh, that I showed you before, where the convenience yield counteracts monetary policy. I can rederive the Euler equation in that setup, setup uh, and you see uh, the first term looks a lot like in the standard uh, New Keynesian model. Uh, what's different from the standard New Keynesian model is this convenience yield here, and that is multiplied by this coefficient, which is this conglomerate of things that have to do with banks, the leverage constraint, one over the mic up, and things that have to do with households, which is this interest rate elasticity. Uh, and again, the, the intuition is always the same, that the, uh, the higher this term, uh, the more impact this convenience yield has, uh, and therefore it lowers the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. I'm uh, proud of how pretty this looks like. Uh, because you can basically see the effect of market power right here by looking at it. I was very happy to see that with pencil and paper. Um, you wonder, is this just a feature of the world we've been in with where banks are flooded with reserves? And so that's what makes me able to say um, monetary policy here really works differently from uh, the world in which it controls the, uh, the interest rate directly. And so therefore, we extended this uh, version with, uh, by having banking with scarce reserves. In a version of the model with scarce reserves, the government controls the reserve rate uh, and the quantity of reserves, but is now targeting the interbank rate. And so it lets the reserve supply adjust so that it can hit the interbank rate. Uh, so now we have interbank lending activity which we don't have in the version with abundant reserves, because right now banks have so many reserves that they never actually have to borrow or lend from each other. So you basically have a Fed funds market that is dead. Uh, in the, before the crisis, we had an interesting interbank market. And so the Fed was targeting the interbank rate, and there was interbank uh, activi lending activity. Let me show you my simple model of how banks operated before the financial crisis when they had to economize on reserves. I'm imagining uh, shocks, liquidity shocks. Uh, these are IID across banks. They arrive after banks have chosen reserves, loans, and deposits. Uh, so in this world, banks must pay uh, some random amount, lambda tilde, times their deposits to other banks. So these are just like deposit withdrawal shocks. Banks have deposits, and a random fraction of these deposits get with, gets withdrawn, and these shocks are IID. There's a competitive fund, Fed funds market uh, that allows banks who run out of reserves to borrow and lend reserves at some rate, IF. Uh, that's the Fed funds rate. And then um, banks come into the period with some reserves. They experience these outflows of deposits or inflows. Uh, and then they can, can decide about their new reserve holdings or whether to um, lend or borrow reserves. Um, the leverage constraint not, must now hold after the liquidity shocks. Uh, so you still have a leverage con collateral constraint, uh, but that has to hold always, including after these liquidity shocks uh, hit. And so what's the optimal policy of banks in this world? Well, if the funds rate is above the interest rate of re on reserves, they borrow if they have few reserves uh, to pay. If, if they find themselves lacking reserves to pay these deposit outflows, they have to borrow from other banks. Uh, otherwise, they're trying to lend out their reserves. If they don't experience these shocks, they lend them out. Um, and so the question is, when, is, when are reserves scarce? Well, if, they're large liquid, if the liquidity shock distribution is such that banks run out of reserves often, uh, that's when they are scarce, or when there are few reserves relative to other collateral. That's uh, generally the situation in which you see a lot of activity uh, of borrowing and lending between banks. Otherwise, if you don't have these, then um, there's no active Fed funds model, and so the the idea is that basically you get the previous model back as a special case if these liquidity shocks are small or, you, or the Fed has injected a ton of reserves. This model has one mechanism, which is that if you flood the banking system with reserves, interest rates will adjust uh, in equilibrium. And so what's going to happen is that you basically create a liquidity trap for banks. They view bonds and 
and reserves as equivalent, uh, so interest rates align, and that's why they're happy to hold these reserves. Uh, but that must be true in equilibrium, otherwise banks would try to get rid of their reserves if, the, if you paid, if somehow this constellation of interest rates weren't there. And so the only difference is that before, you could have an interbank market at which uh, and banks would be happy to borrow and lend to each other at some rate, but that rate would be higher than the interest rate on, on reserves. And in particular, before the crisis, we didn't have even an interest rate on reserves. So it, basically, this was zero. And so the optimal policy of a bank when the uh, Fed funds rate is larger than zero was exactly to economize on reserves and to lend them out uh, whenever they could. And so that's, that's the model. So, so this basically think of the previous model as a that I showed you with banks with abundant reserves as a special case of this model where you had a lot, if you inject a lot of reserves, uh, then you're back to that version of the model. So here, uh, there's a Fed funds market, banks borrow and lend to each other, and what policy does is they uh, target the interbank rate, the Fed funds rate, uh, and they fix a reserve rate, uh, IM, uh, the reserve uh, supply adjusts so that uh, we, meet, we can meet this target for the Fed funds rate. And so there's a new endogenous object, which is the Fed funds rate. So I can again substitute, I don't need to show you all the symbols, I can uh, again substitute out and I get a, a bank collateral demand, which now depends on two spreads. One is the spread between the sh uh, short rate and the Fed funds rate, and the other is the spread between the short rate and the reserve rate. It's the same structure as earlier. Uh, the policy instrument here determines the uh, demand for bank collateral. Uh, and the coefficients for how this uh, demand for bank, bank collateral looks like, they depend on financial structure, and now including the distribution of these liquidity shocks that I've introduced. Um, reserves uh, are now endogenous, but loan shocks uh, still matter for the transmission of monetary policy shocks. So let me. Let me conclude uh, by summarizing what I just told you. I showed you uh, an equivalence result, basically, between a model that has central bank di digital currency, electronic money issued by the government directly to households, uh, and banking models. In all these models, the policy instrument had a convenience yield. Uh, and that changes the determinacy of the new Keynesian model for a broad range of policy rules. So we can now study an interest rate peg. The model is still determinate. It doesn't, even if it doesn't depend at all on, the, on inflation. So I can study a much broader range of policy rules. Also, the Fed here has two policy instruments, not just the interest rate, but also the quantity of money that there are or reserves in the banking model that they control. The key parameter for the transmission of monetary policy is the interest elasticity of reserve demand. And that has two components. One is, uh, is a feature of the households, is how interest rate elastic is their money demand. And the other component has to do with banks. It depends on financial structure, in other words. It, uh, it matters how leveraged banks are. Uh, more leverage looks a lot like less interest rate elasticity. It matters how many uh, nominal rigidities you have in bank assets, so how much real versus nominal assets bank have, and it depends on how competitive banks are and whether there's market power. Um, shocks to other bank assets, uh, they look a lot like money shocks, uh, and they, that the reason why they look like money shocks is that banks here are the providers of money, and so shocks to their assets show up as money shocks um, to us households. So this is the setup uh, that I wanted to show you, yeah. The way I think about it is that we need to understand why um, monetary policy might not be as powerful as we think it is when we write down the new Keynesian model. Uh, in the new Keynesian model, the Fed has ultimate powers by immediately fixing the interest rate that goes into the Euler equation of households. And uh, here, the if you think through that logic of what households are doing in their lives. They hold uh, other assets like bank equity. They receive a rate of return on bank equity, but then they get an interest rate on deposits that is much lower. And so how do you think about this feature in a model? The fact that banks give them 
a rate of return, and then at the same time, they're very happy to hold money, and money earns a very, if you check lately, what the interest rate is that you're receiving on either your bank account or your money market mutual fund is very low. And so the, uh, those rates are low, liquid rates are low, and so the, the question is, is, could that be a mechanism that weakens the transmission? And so the model tells you, yep, uh, the fact that here you have banks that endogenously supply the money uh, weakens the transmission mechanism. I totally agree that there are other ways uh, that uh, the transmission mechanism is affected, especially when you have, here you have one household, it would be, uh, exciting to introduce heterogeneity here and to think about what happens if you have banks and heterogeneous households um, where, where st a step away from that. So this is the first version that just says the Fed is not as powerful as you think. Yes. So here in my, well, at the end of the day, they do have to set uh, the interest rate on reserves. Now that we're away from zero, they have to think about how to set that rate. And so as long as they have to set that rate, uh, there's, there's going to be some policy rule for the reserve rates that they're operating because they have to choose the level of these interest rates. Uh, whether that is because they are targeting, for example, repo rates, that, that could be a special uh, inter interest rate policy that they're using. Uh, the, the principle here is as soon as they do that, as soon as they're setting the interest on reserves, they're having, uh, their policy instrument has a convenience yield, and so the dynamics of the model change. And so that, that's, the, that's, the, that, that's the important, I would say, message from this. So, so this, uh, this is partially my, my answer also to up, is if you have a model with, uh, with banks, uh, the, what, what's an important consideration is whether the government can issue freely reserves. If you think it's totally free for the government to issue as many reserves as they want, uh, which is a form of government debt, so I, I'm not in that camp, but suppose it's free, uh, then you could think that the government floods the economy with reserves, gives all of us accounts at the, at the, at the central bank, uh, then we can have digital currencies issued by the central bank, uh, and wonderful. Uh, and the more the better, because that's basically, that's driving the convenience yield to zero. Um, but I, I don't think that this is the world we live in, because we have governments that have, uh, that can default, they can um, do bad things in many different ways. Uh, and if you think about that world, then there's a trade-off between the government running the payment system or banks running the payment system. If you think that banks uh, the private sector is more efficient at running this payment system, then maybe you do want uh, the banks to provide the uh, payments. And then it's not completely clear how much debt to issue. And uh, so we may have um, a low amount of reserves just because there's a default cost by the government uh, by issuing too much debt. Um, one implication, though, is immediately clear that if the government has a lot of debt outstanding, such as the US government. One implication of the model would be to say, why not issue uh, this debt in terms of reserves? Uh, so if you have the option between T-bills and reserves, it uh, reduces costs within the banking system uh, if, these if there's more reserves in, as opposed to just T-bills, uh, because that makes the provision of money cheaper. Uh, it, lowers the production cost of inside money by banks. Uh, and so that's one, one strong implication. And so right now there's this debate, should we go back to scarce reserves? I would say for a country like the US that has plenty of debt, why not keep reserves flush? Uh, because we have debt already, why not make it cheaper for banks to produce inside money? Uh, it's, it's a totally different story for other countries. For example, if you, uh, if you look at Switzerland, uh, Switzerland had such a low amount of debt that they could, wouldn't even be able to run the payment system that is going on in Swiss francs, uh, given how little debt they have. Even if they converted everything into reserves, they wouldn't be able to issue. Like they had in June, they voted on an initiative that is called the Vollgeld Initiative, uh, which was the idea that we should all have, or Swiss citizens should all have reserve accounts at their central bank. Uh, and they voted that down, uh, mostly because the initiative was coupled with having a zero interest rate on that account. So people didn't like that. People wanted to have positive interest rates on their, on their central bank digital currency. Uh, but you'll see more and more these proposals by people, mostly in many countries this has to do with 
citizens who are upset at the banking system and want to basically circumvent the banking system and have accounts with the central bank. Uh, that's part of the political economy of what we see. Um, but also because some countries literally have eliminated any kind of uh, role of uh, current actual currency. So this is the model basically of, of a modern currency where everything is electronic and where it's just issued by banks. Uh, that's the model for Sweden. Sweet, there's no currency in Sweden. Uh, and so the, if this is the world you think we're, we're, I think we're going to go towards that world, then the question is who's issuing uh, this, this money? And, and maybe the government is not all that bad at uh, managing a payment. How, you know, how difficult can it be uh, to have? Uh, <laughs> I think the government is bad at many things. But if you think about just payments, you know, having some account at the Fed, that can't be very difficult. They already have the banks that have these accounts. So it can't be very difficult to do. So maybe this is a good idea. Uh, and so we should be deep, deep. I think this is an exciting uh, discussion to have. This paper is not really addressed to answer all these questions. But you see the trade-offs in the, in the model. They're already going on uh, here. Thank you.